Get your line on the water in front of you if you want distance. You need to load the rod quickly and the water tension on the line and the weight of the line loads the rod. A short bow and arrow cast takes this trap. Here I'll use a flip cast. Simply hold the leader just above the fly. With the wrist, flip the rod tip and release the fly at the same time. Now get the line moving in front of the rod and squeeze the rod handle for the next cast. Oops, that last cast went a little high. If you shake that limb that much, those trout are gone. You rhododensis double-bladed fly-grabbing hook no son of a... Stay cool. This isn't the first time you've hung up, and it won't be the last. Even fly fishers make mistakes. Once again, the flip cast set up the next one. With the line on the water, I can kick out additional line. The water tension enabled this to happen. Now I have enough line on the water to shoot the distance I need. And I needed it to take this fish. It was bare up a far piece. One of the most challenging casts is when you've got to go under a log or bush from far away and there isn't a lot of room behind you. After these first couple of casts, I'll move over to my right for more casting freedom. I'm a lefty. The secret to getting back under anything is to drift the rod tip to the level of what you want to go under, and then do no more than squeeze the rod handle. With the thumb pushing down, the back two fingers pulling just to squeeze. What this does is to tighten the loop. It isn't the fly you are casting under the obstruction, it's the loop. And I just tightened the loop. Trout can be in the most inaccessible places. It's their protection. In one of my profound statements, don't be afraid to cast into impossible places. You can't do more than hang up. And that isn't life-threatening. This is a nice little brookie. That was a challenge. I like that. Of those who have mastered the art of fly fishing and fly tying, few have done it so aptly and have passed it on to so many as George Harvey. George initiated the first angling class on a collegiate level in 1934 in the United States, and until his retirement from Penn State University in 1972, taught an estimated 36,000 students to tie and fly fish. He is without peers on a mountain stream, and today, at 86 years of age, is making his last run on a mountain stream. He is the tradition, and history is in the making. And so, George, thank you for being with me today. Well, thank you for inviting me along. I would have never been out, and this will probably be my last uh, time on a, on a mountain stream. And I know that we've spent so many hours fishing these small mountain streams when they were really good before they started electro fishing and before they started writing stories about all the fish in these mountain streams. They used to be wonderful. We, I can remember many days when we would catch 35, 40 trout and think nothing of it. And today, you'd be lucky to catch a half a dozen going up through the same stretch of water. These streams used to be so full of fish that you could walk up to a pool and catch them without any trouble at all. And I imagine today, if we catch a couple, we'll be lucky. The first trout I caught was the stream that flowed out of the Dubois Reservoir, and it was called Anderson Creek. And my dad was primarily a bait fisherman, but he had some wet flies, and he rigged me up with a bait, and I was only six years old, rigged me up with a bait, and then he put a dropper wet fly on about uh, 15 inches back of the bait. And I was fishing down in a, a riffle, and the riffle was pulling the bait out and the fly was bobbing just on top of the water and a little brook trout, they were all brook trout back in those days, a little brook trout started jumping and they must have jumped ten times after that fly as it was bobbing on the top of the water and finally it hooked itself and I reeled it in and it was big enough to keep and that was my first trout that I ever caught on a fly but that got me started and 
My dad gave me one of these little, like, like a pocketbook full of wet flies, and I started uh, fishing with two wet flies instead of bait. And anybody that could get a fly in the water, the fish weren't scared in those days, you could catch uh, trout. And I started catching a, a good many trout and from that time on until I was 10 years old when I started tying flies. I caught hundreds of trout uh, at that young age. In a few more years, I'm wondering if I can do the same thing that you're doing right now. Well, let's go up to this next hole and see if we can let's catch see. a fish. I'd like to see us catch one anyway. Just one. OK, Just we'll, one. we'll give it a shot. OK. Eighty years of fly fishing, and though unsteady on his feet, his casting is as smooth as silk. A quick glance behind to check the clearance for the back cast, and a perfect overhand cast. Each cast covers a different area. The fly has time and the velocity changes. Now for added distance, a roll cast. He covered the water beautifully and now moves on. To watch the master is to learn. The rod is vertical on the back cast. The thumb comes up into the cast. It's a short forward stroke. Whoops! Missed him. George is fishing a deer hair beetle with a bright patch of fluorescent yarn on top. An innovation of his long before it ever hit the newsstands. And fluorescent wings on dry flies? A first in this nation. Even crystal flash wings for trichos. And at 86, you're not as quick as you were in your youthful years. And when you tangle your fly and leader, when you don't see well, it's nice to get a little help from a friend. This is the camaraderie and the companionship that has been fostered over the years. A close friendship is a thing of value to share on the stream. You build wonderful memories. And when that time comes, when you can't fish, that's all you have, just good memories. George, tell me how you were given the name Indian when you were a kid. Well, the doctor used to take me out, I was uh, I was probably, when I started going with them, was around 12 years old. And they used to go up to Cross Fork, that's a tributary of Kettle Creek, and they used to stay in the cabin most of the time playing poker. And they'd send me out to catch trout. Well, anybody that could get a fly in the water could catch trout. And the limit was 25, and I didn't know any better. And I would go out and catch a limit of a little brook trout over six inches long and come back and they would come out and, and clean the fish and they had a big can that they sunk in a spring at the camp and they, they'd tell me to go out and catch some more. Well, I didn't know any better and I'd go out and catch uh, another 25 <laughs> and it was, it was easy. Anybody that could have dropped a fly in the water could have caught fish. I wasn't a good fisherman, but I got so that I could cast 25 or 30 feet in front of me and I had no trouble catching all the trout I wanted because there wasn't any competition and the streams were just loaded with fish. Those were happy years, oh, weren't they? Oh, they were great they were years. Glorious yeah. years. Yeah. It is the end of an era. It's been a wonderful period of time in the life of this man. A great journey along so many forested streams. George had the best, the streams teeming with trout little or no competition, and the time and solitude to gain an in-depth knowledge and understanding of this great game. An understanding that few will ever attain, and the enjoyment of sharing it with others. I suppose it's poetic that he doesn't land a fish on this last trip in the mountains. Maybe the good Lord meant it to be that way. Well, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed every minute that I've spared that were spent with people, teaching them to, to, to cast. And it, fishing is the greatest leisure time activity there, there is in, in the world today. And here in the United States, we probably have 35 to 40 million people who use fishing as a leisure time. 
And the reason why it's so good is because you can fish all year long. Beautiful trees and the flowers and the shrubs and you can see the, the wildlife when you're fishing and it, it's so much better than being having a leisure sport where you're in, indoor and you see the same thing every time. So I, I've enjoyed every minute that I've spent teaching people how to fish and I still am helping people and I hope that I am able to continue a good many more years. Gone are the giant oaks and the hemlock trees, replaced by those of youthful generations that still maintain a wriggle beauty, sustain the banks, and offer cover to the native trout within. Rhododendron and hemlock boughs offer shade and protection and beauty as well. Our only hope to save the native brook trout is through our legal guardians, our state and federal agencies, who are entrusted to protect our streams. These agencies have no oath under God to destroy these fragile resources, but the most sacred one to defend and protect them. And we as fishers of trout must carefully return the native brook trout to its pool, fish too valuable to creel, so that they may continue to reproduce as species for future generations to enjoy. This is our tradition, our legacy, and history to preserve. Oh yes, why the creel? Daryl Arajo, one of the premier basket weavers in the United States, made it for me in 1980. It's light, attractive, comfortable, and an out-of-the-way place for equipment. It beats wearing a hot, heavy vest. 